Okay, many of you are aware that here at, at Emmanuel Fellowship, we're involved in a study of the book of Hebrews, uh, going through chapter by chapter, and uh, it's been a real blessing. And so tonight, we're on chapter five uh, of the book, and we have uh, Brother Shane Nichols to give us this teaching tonight. Brother Shane, come and bless your people. Amen. Um, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for all of the things, Lord, that you have given us, all of the blessings, Father, that you have poured out upon our lives, Lord. And Lord, uh, that you are a God, Lord, who is, who is touched, Lord, uh, by our concerns and our cares, Lord, and that you are a God uh, that uh, has an open heaven, Lord, before us. You have an open ear. Lord, to us, Father. Uh, you're not an empty idol, Lord, that uh, sits on a shelf, Lord, or a God that we need to cower in fear to, Lord. But, Lord, that you are a God that has open arms before us, Lord, and, and you extend arms of love, Lord, and, and grace and passion, Lord, towards your people, Lord, and towards your creation. And, Father, we would just pray that as we go to your word this evening, Father, that, that there would be an impartation, Lord, in our perspective, Father, of who you are, Lord, that we would have a little bit deeper of a glimpse, Lord, into the person of you, Lord, and what you represent, Father. And Lord, we thank you, Father, that we could come together, Lord, as a body tonight, Lord, and, and partake of the food, Father, that you would have for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If we could go to Hebrews chapter 5. Sometimes when we think of Christ, I think that we fall into looking at particular aspects of who Christ is. Um, or we'll look at particular aspects or particular, a particular work that he accomplished while he was on earth. Sometimes we'll look at the, the birth or the incarnation of Christ. At other times we'll look at the death. and We might focus on that. And what I like to do sometimes when, when I study the scripture is not necessarily just focus on you know, just maybe one particular area, but maybe back away from it and try and, and, try and get a broad perspective. And it's sometimes when we look at that broad perspective, those little parts become that much clearer and that much more important. And I know particularly, particularly with, with Christ, I've gone through many years where there wasn't a strong emphasis on the birth of Christ. And I look at the birth of Christ as just a necessary step in order for him to die for my sins and die for the sins of the world, uh, you know, through his death and resurrection. But if there wasn't the incarnation, there could never be the death. And the incarnation, you know, the birth of Christ isn't any less or any more valuable than the death and resurrection. But sometimes we tend in our, in our walk and in our perspective to maybe just focus on one particular angle. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes that's a particular area that God wants to work on. Um, but as we go into Hebrews, I, I, you know, chapter 5 here, I, I want to try and take us and, you know, on our computer screens, if we go to like, Google Earth, or and you, you can look up your home, and you can actually, you know, have a satellite picture that can actually bring you to your home, and you can see a picture of your car. And sometimes, you know, it's nice to be able to see that detail, 
but then you can hit the little button and it backs you up and you start to see the, the whole landscape. And it's just as amazing to see the landscape as it is the fine detail. Uh, Hebrews chapter 5, starting at verse 1. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof, he ought as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. Just stop there and just look at some of the things here that the author of Hebrews is bringing out. Starts out by saying that the person that is to, to be called the priest must be taken from among men. And the reason that the priest must be taken from among men is that only in a man can that priest understand the weaknesses of humanity and understand the weaknesses of mankind. If there was a particular creature, um, you know, whatever it would be, whatever your imagination could work up, that creature most likely couldn't understand the difficulties and the things that we have to endure in, as humans because they're not created in the same way that we have been created. They're entirely different than us. And so the priest who is the representative on earth, uh, he's the, the go-between between humanity and God for other mankind, for the rest of humanity or the rest of the nation of Israel, however you want to view it this evening, that person must understand the position that we are in in order to have compassion for us. So it's necessary that that person that goes before God has compassion on the people that he's representing. And you think about some of the different scriptures that we've read. We know about the Pharisees. We know about the Sadducees. And they had a religiosity about them where they didn't really have a care for the people they were more concerned about what they could gain from the people. And that doesn't qualify as a proper or a right representative before the Lord as a person who stands in that gap, you know, who, who offers up the sacrifices before the Lord. Because that person's heart isn't truly for the rest of humanity. And one of the things that one of the things that um, has always been a blessing to me is that when I've had a pastor or, or when I've had a spiritual father, that they wouldn't stand in judgment of me. If I go before a, a pastor or somebody who I esteem in the Lord, and there's any hint of the fact that they will stand in judgment of me and they'll condemn me, I'm not going to be as responsive to them as I would if I knew that they understood the struggles that I had and that they were ready and willing to wrap their hands of love and mercy around me. It's a lot easier to talk to somebody who's had the same struggles that you have had than to talk to somebody who hasn't had those struggles. If I had struggles with lying, well, I'm not going to go talk to somebody who's never had an issue with lying because a lot of times a person that's never had an issue with lying isn't going to understand that weakness. So I, there's something that's within me that's going to think that you're really not going to understand you know, the issues. You're really not going to understand the struggles that I have. Now, that's not to say that 
just because one person, you know, hasn't struggled, you know, that they're not going to be open. But I think that you get the, the point that I'm trying to bring forth, that I want to know that when I'm going to you to seek help, that you're going to realize that you're a human as well and that you're susceptible to struggles as well. And going on to that, a priest isn't ordained for his own behalf. A priest is ordained for the behalf of mankind. It needs to be a position that is totally selfless. It's a position that's totally given to the agent that's being represented. <clears throat> Interesting commentary has this to say about the high priest. The high priest must also be a man of compassion as the word, this word for compassion in the Greek is actually metropathene which underlies the phrase deal gently implies this is the capacity to moderate one's feelings to avoid the extremes of cold indifference and uncontrolled sadness. For an ordinary high priest of the Old Testament, this sympathy grew out of the awareness that he himself was subject to weakness, prone to failures of his own. Hence, in his sacrificial activities, he must make the necessary offerings for his own and the people's sins. So that when the priest would go before the Lord to make the sacrifices, he was acknowledging and he was making the representation for the whole, for the whole group of Israel, not the people behind him, but from him and back, including himself. If we could go to Numbers chapter 14. starting at verse 11. And the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people provoke Me? And how long will it be ere they believe Me? For all the signs which I have showed among them, I will smite them with the pestilence and disinherit them and will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. And Moses said unto the Lord, Then the Egyptians shall hear it, for thou broughtest up thy people in thy might from among them. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of the land, for they have heard that the Lord art among his people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them, by daytime in a pillar of a cloud, and a pillar of fire by night. Now if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he sware unto them, therefore he hath slain them in the wilderness. And now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great according as thou hast spoken, saying, The Lord is long suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy, and as thou hast forgiven the people from Egypt even until now. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. You know, we, we had, you know, earlier on we had talked about prayer and being able to interact with God. Here God had said to Moses, and remember Moses, remember Moses previously was afraid to go into Egypt and afraid to bring the people out of Egypt because he didn't think that, first of all, they would listen to him. And secondly, there was the fear of Egypt itself. He had to go to Pharaoh, and there was that fear that Moses had. But now we see a different Moses. We see a Moses that is actually standing before God and saying to God, God, don't kill these people. 
And God said, you know, God was to the point where he was going to destroy the people. He said to Moses, he said, I will bring forth a people out of you and I'm going to destroy these people. I'm going to destroy these people because God had had it up to here with them. When Moses went before the Lord, Moses wasn't going on his own behalf because the Lord had already told him that he was going to spare him and bring forth the people out of him. But there was something in Moses that realized his own weaknesses, realized the mercy and the grace that God had given out to him, and therefore he was willing to stand before the Lord and actually ask God and actually disagree with God and say, God, you shouldn't do this. Because he had a heart for the people that God had called him to. That's the type of representative that I want when I need help, spiritually speaking. I want somebody that's going to stand before God and he's going to plead on my half and he's going to plead plead my case and say, God, You are a God of mercy. You are a God who is long-suffering. And as we continue on, if we could just look at one other person, if we could look at Abraham, um, chapter Genesis, chapter eighteen. Verse twenty-three. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Preadventure there be fifty righteous within the city, wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. I'm not going to continue reading because we know the story. God came down, he spoke to Abraham, and he said, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Obviously, in the back of Abraham's mind, he was considering Lot, and he was considering Lot's family, and maybe some of the friends that Lot had. We don't know. The Bible doesn't really uh, go into that much detail. But there was something within Abraham that said, God please don't destroy the righteous along with the wicked. There was something that God had developed a relationship such with Abraham where Abraham actually had the very ear of God because God said, if there be 50 righteous, I will spare that city. And it was on Abraham's behalf because Abraham went before the Lord on behalf of these people. How much more when we consider people that are around us where we would quickly want to judge their actions and we want to judge their attitude, how much more do we need to actually stand in a place on their behalf? Another aspect that's brought out in Hebrews chapter 5 in these first few verses here, that a priest of the Lord is not chosen by man. The priest of the Lord is chosen by God. If we think that God has you know, called us to act as a priest or God has called us to you know, some type of ministry, and if that desire is built up on false premise or built up on ungodly reasons, you know, because there are people out there that want to be involved with ministry, they want to be involved with some particular calling, simply because they want to bring glory to their name. And um, if we're familiar with the, the parable about the, um, the, what is it, the, the wheat and the tares and, and, and we're, in the different parables that Jesus talks about, it, the judgment at the end times, we know that there's people who felt that they would qualify for the kingdom of God, but they didn't, even though they have done, you know, mighty acts in his name. You know, what was the heart and what was the motivation, bef- you know, bef- you know that, that, that caused them to want to serve God? What was the motivation? Was the motivation out of love 
and out of a calling by God, did the ordination come from God, or was it something that was self-motivated and self-driven? In the Old Testament, if uh, we don't have to go there, but if you want to write this down, if you're taking notes, it was Aaron's descendants who would become the priest of God. And if you could look that up, it's in Exodus, um, Exodus chapter 28, verse 1. Continuing on in chapter 5, starting at verse 5, So also Christ glorified not Himself to be made an high priest, but He that said unto Him, Thou art My Son, today I have begotten Thee. As He said also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Something I want to bring out here. Jesus was ordained by God. He wasn't chosen by man. We know that they were looking for an earthly king. And when he did not fulfill uh, the Israelites' expectations of a worldly king, an earthly king to, uh, to destroy Rome and push Rome completely out of Israel, they became disenchanted with him. And they decided that he wasn't adequate to be their Messiah. But that wasn't the Messiah that God had ordained. Um, Christ was called and chosen by God, not by man, not by Israel. But it says here that God actually spoke out and He said, Thou art My Son, today have I begotten Thee. Now, that's an important word, that word begotten. If I were to create a robot, that robot was created by me, but that robot wasn't begotten by me. That word begotten, what that brings out, it's something of God's own kind. It is the image. It is, it is the person of God. My son is begotten of me and my wife. He is the image of us. Our children can be begotten of us. Christ can be begotten of God. But something that we create is not begotten of us. It's created by us. There's a difference there. And we, in our unsaved state, are created by God. We are not begotten of God. So when this passage of Scripture says that Christ was begotten, it speaks of something that was entirely different than who we are. Even though He was human, He was entirely different than us because He was begotten of God. If we could go to Psalms chapter 2, verse 7. It's a prophetic psalm of Christ. I will declare the decree, the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. I had mentioned earlier that sometimes when we look at Christ, we look at particular elements or we look at particular aspects of Christ. But when we look at Christ, if we could just back away and see Him from the full perspective, we think of you know, His death and His resurrection, but it was actually His whole life that represents the work that He did. There isn't necessarily particular importance or emphasis on the death. There isn't necessarily a particular importance or emphasis on the resurrection or on the birth. It was that whole entire complete work. Even though Christ was begotten of God, He had to become something entirely different than what He was before the incarnation. 
you know, if you could take and take an animal, maybe if you have like a, a cow or a sheep and, or, or a wild horse and you let it run free, it has all of this freedom. It has no boundaries. But in essence, when Christ became man, he was, all, he was, he was put into like a, a real tight-fitting box, if I could explain it that way. He became something entirely different than what he was when he was seated with the Father. So it's not just the death that was part of his suffering. It was actually the whole concept and the whole fact that he was incarnated, that he became something less than who he was on behalf of humanity, on the behalf of mankind. I just want to read uh, an excerpt uh, from C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. Speaking of this, it says, We are not begotten by God. We are only made by Him. In our natural state, we are not sons of God, only statues. We have not got spiritual life, only our biological life, which is presently going to run down and die. Now the whole offer which Christianity makes is this, that we can, if we let God have His way, come to share in the life of Christ. If we do, we shall then be sharing a life which was begotten, not made, which always has existed and always will exist. Because of the work that Christ did, the whole work, we have the opportunity to become begotten. We're no longer just that creature. We actually become begotten of God. We take on the image of Christ. And when we think of Christ and we think of the things that He had to suffer and the things that he had to endure. We know in Ephesians it says this. It says, what that he ascended, but that he also descended first to the lowest parts of the earth. He became man. He died. He went to the grave in the same way that we will eventually go to the grave. And he did all of this. He experienced all of the things that we as humanity have to experience so that he can become familiar with our afflictions, and he could become familiar with our infirmities without sin. And, you know, sometimes we think to ourselves when we go through hard times, we think that, you know what, God, I know you sent Christ, and, and Jesus, I know that you were tempted in the same way that I was tempted, but you were still God. You couldn't fail. Or maybe you could fail. That's a debate. That's an in-house Christian debate. But the thing is, is that I would say that Christ is more familiar with our afflictions and our infirmities than we could ever be because He allowed Himself to become something so much more less than who and what He had when He was with the Father when he was part of the triune God, when he was in heaven before he descended, he, he was something far greater than what he became confined to when he was incarnated. If we could go over to Psalms uh, chapter 110, verse 4. Just keep your finger there. I just want to continue reading. <clears throat> Verse 6 in Hebrews chapter 5. As he said also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard, and that he feared. Jumping back over to Psalms 110. It's a prophetic verse of Christ as well. Verse 4, 
The Lord has sworn and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And now I'm not going to get into Melchizedek a whole lot because that's, uh, we're going to go into more detail with that in a couple chapters. Um, but a couple things um, that I wanted to bring out uh, from verse 6 in Hebrews chapter uh, 5, or verse 7, it says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard and that he feared. When we consider these supplications and prayers, it's very easy for us to just go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And that's definitely part of the, the, the supplication in, in the prayer. But it is actually more probable that it comes from the sacrifice and the crying out on the cross. It is the sacrifice that the Savior is actually providing for us on behalf of us. Remember I had talked about how Moses actually acted as a go-between between the Israelites and God. And then Abraham acted as a go-between, as, as, a, as an arbitrator between Sodom and Gomorrah and God. And he said, God, if there's 50 people in there, will you not spare the city? Psalms uh, chapter 22, if we could turn there real quick. Psalms chapter 22, verses 20 through to 24. I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel, for he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. It's a prophetic passage of scripture of Christ crying out on the cross and when Christ cried out when he was on that cross God did not turn his head from that cry God heard that cry and that cry wasn't just because of the anguish that he was suffering remember that when he went to that cross he went as a representation of each and every one of us in this room and outside of these four walls. He went as a representation, that crying out and that anguish, that obedience before the Lord was his act as a go-between for you and I. And the honor and the blessing of that crying out is and was that God heard him. And that cry and that crying out and those supplications before the Lord got God's attention. <clears throat> Moses had a relationship where he was able to get God's attention on behalf of the people. Abraham had a relationship with God where he was able to get God's attention on the behalf of his people. Jesus had a relationship that was far better than Moses or Abraham could have ever have had. Jesus got the attention of our Heavenly Father with His life and His obedience. God that became man, that became familiar with our afflictions, He became familiar with our infirmities. Anything that you're struggling with, and anything that you're going through and anything that you're enduring at this season in your life, Jesus is touched by that. Continuing on in Psalms chapter 20 through, uh, 22, verses 25 through 31. My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. 
The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds and the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. All they that be fat upon earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare the righteousness unto a people that shall be born, that he hath done this. Christ is that seed. He is that representation. When he cried out on the cross to God, when he lived his life before God, he did it on behalf of you and me. He became something entirely different He became something entirely compartmentalized. He didn't have, he talked about like the wild horses in the Midwest that have that freedom to run and go wherever they want. But you take that same horse and you put it in a horse trailer and you confine it to that horse trailer. When God became man, there was a constriction of who he was. He gave himself over to mankind to be destroyed by mankind all so that he could intercede on our behalves to become that great priest, to become that great high priest. John chapter 12, the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 20. We could go there. Starting at verse 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it bideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there will he also be. If any man serve me, him will my Father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. So we see that Jesus is talking about a seed and he's saying that unless that seed goes into the ground and dies, it will not bring forth life. Jesus dying and being put in the grave and coming forth isn't the full representation of that seed dying. That seed, think of it this way, we as humanity, the day we are born, we start to die. Right? We start to die. The day we are born, we are start to die. The day that Christ was born, he was in a body that started to die. The seed being cast into the ground and dying, in the overall perspective, was Christ becoming man. And unless God became man, and unless he died as a man, then that tree wouldn't be able to come forth and to grow. Christ's life, his whole entire life, was his sacrifice, not just his death and resurrection. It was becoming a man. It was becoming a man who understood temptation. He became a man that understood 
what it meant to be bruised and to be beaten and to be chastised and to be ridiculed. Think of it. Think of it. When Jesus, in, you know, throughout the New Testament, he had 70 disciples, but eventually those 70 disciples left. Then he had 12. And then when he was being crucified, how many of those disciples remained faithful? He knew what it was like to be abandoned by the people that he represented. All because he knew that there was a promise of that tree that would come forth out of his obedience. And with his life, he had to be obedient in all facets. Not just the death, but he had to be obedient in all facets of his life. That's why at the end of this passage of Scripture that we just read, he said, Lord, if this hour can be taken from me, let it be taken from me. That was the humanity that he did not want to have to endure this suffering. But at the same time, he was willing to say, but God, let your will be done. Let your will be accomplished. Continuing on in Hebrews chapter 5, Verses uh, 6 through 10. As he said also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him, that was able to save him from the death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, Yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. We're going to stop there with with verse 11. I, I believe that 11 and 14 go on with 6. So we're going to carry that on next week. But it says here, and just starting at verse 8 and reading through again, it said, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation to all of them that obey him, called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all of them that obey him. Him. There was nothing self serving about the life that Christ lived. He had an agenda, and that was for all of them who would obey Him, who that would follow His lead and would follow His example. That is the priest. That is the high priest that we have without beginning or end who is willing to become us to fully understand what we go through so that He could act on our behalf to the Father as our representation. And not only does He act as our representation, But he was brought to the place where there was so much suffering in his crying out to the Lord that he was heard. He was heard because of his obedience. He was heard because he completed every facet of the life that God had called him to live. He became that representation that none of us in that room can be. He became that representation so that we are no longer the creature, but we become the begotten of the Lord. We are no longer the created. We are now the begotten. We are the begotten of the Lord. Go ahead and end there uh, this evening. See a bunch of kids that are ready to go home. Just.